Welcome to week 52 of Mission Diane Watch Santa Barbara. Hello. Only six days left in the first year of Santa Barbara. We watched episode 251, which originally aired Monday, July 22nd, 1985. And I don't know if the sweeps have started yet. Sometimes they start a few days or, uh, in, you know, towards the end of the month before. They're generally most of August, I think. And we find out that Nick is alive. Mm -hmm. So your guess was wrong. <laughs> Nick is not the person who left on Friday. Oh, Eden has told the sheriff that Nick kidnapped Kelly, so they won't let Nick help to search for Kelly. Uh, but Cruz tells the sheriff to keep uh, to have the staff keep Eden out of the room where Nick is while Cruz and the sheriff go searching. I think it was Cruz and the sheriff. Might have been the deputy. Uh, I think it was the sheriff. While they go searching for Nick. So, out in the red van, Chuck tells Jack's cousin that they have Kelly and are still looking for Nick. And uh, they're in contact with a helicopter throughout, but I thought uh, Cruz mentioned that they got the helicopter pilot at one point, so mm -hmm. I'm wondering if they reordered these scenes a little bit, because the pilot is still free through most of the scenes with Chuck and James. Um, so Kelly wakes up in the van while they're digging a grave for her and the license plates that they plan to bury. Um, Kelly tries to escape when they take her out of the van, but uh, she fails. And uh, she mentions Jack and the missile silo, and they realize that she's regained her memory. So that bash on the head did actually regain uh, Kelly's memory. Uh, it's a bit weird because, you know, normally on a soap you lose your memory by hitting it, and then mm -hmm. you regain it by hitting it. Yeah. In this case, she lost her memory with a, with a, what is it called? It was some sort of, well, it was a machine that took away her memory. In this case, she lost her memory with an auto mnemonic limbic retrograder. So you wouldn't think a bash on the head would make any difference. You'd think something like hip hypnosis or something would mm -hmm. to be, be used. Um, so uh, they take a few more photos of Kelly tied up, I guess, to help uh, seal Nick's fate. Uh, but just as they're about to kill her, Cruz and the sheriff show up. And Chuck and James are arrested, and Cruz tells Kelly that her family's been going crazy for the last three and a half weeks. And Kelly says, three and a half weeks? I've only been gone for a day. Mm -hmm. So the bash on their head has wiped out her time in the ghost town with Nick. So that is an interesting turn of events, because although Nick's not going to be, you know, feeling the wrath of the Capwells for too much longer for kidnapping Kelly, mm -hmm. um, they're going to want to know what happened for the three and a half weeks they were gone, you know? Yeah. And um, Cruz had thought it was odd that they stayed gone for that long, you know? And uh, Nick had told him, oh, well, at first it was because the river was high, and then neither of us wanted to leave. And Cruz said, I don't think I want to know any more about that. So I think the Capwells will suspect the same thing. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, Perhaps Kelly will too, but uh, I wonder if Nick will actually tell Kelly, or if he'll hope that her memory comes back, or if she won't feel the same way about him, so he'll be too embarrassed to tell her what happened. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, because definitely, in a way, this is playing out the way he had actually feared initially when he was rebuffing Kelly's advances when they were in the ghost town. I think mm -hmm. he was afraid that um, it would look like he was taking advantage of her. And that is potentially how it, it could play out, because even if she absolves him of actually kidnapping her in the first place, um, that three-week gap could be seen as even him holding her against her will or holding her under false pretenses if she was injured. Mm -hmm. Also, Kelly could be pregnant, too, for all we know. Sure. So eventually, he would have to tell her what happened. Uh, apparently, Gina's still pregnant. We haven't heard much about that. No. Hopefully, she's managing to kick the pill habit while she's off. In New and Jack removes the stone from his cell and sees Julia in the garden of the palace. Uh, Julia asks Jack's cousin if she can see the new king. And uh, she says 
the current king's, and then Jack's cousin reveals grandson. So this is not what we had thought. We thought mm. that somehow the old king was unable to impregnate his young, much younger princess, but it appears that the princess's husband is a prince mm -hmm. uh, that is the son of the king. So perhaps he was unable to reproduce successfully. That's what we think at this point, but we're about to find out what really has happened. Yes, we're um, not even sure really if he's still alive, I would think. Jack's cousin introduces Julia to the Prime Minister. And when Julia leaves, the Prime Minister talks about the drilling rights, and Jack's cousin says, under the terms we agreed. And the PM says, do you think I'd go back on my word to you, Jerry? <laughs> Finally, we, we know what to call Jack's cousin. We can call him Jerry. We still don't know his last name, though. Is it Jerry Lee? I don't know. He reveals that they've been keeping Jack in an old dungeon that the king sealed off 30 years ago. Jerry goes to visit Jack, and Jack says, Jack sees that he looks exactly like him and says, Oh, they always took us for brothers. Jerry said, I just made a few adjustments. And Jack says, What, they take a saw to your chin? Yeah, I thought it was really, really funny the way Jack still manages to to throw shade on Jerry, even in this encounter where, you know, Jerry's come down, he's coming to gloat, he's coming to sort of lord over Jack, over how he's taken over his life, and, and even in these circumstances, Jack manages to better him. Mm-hmm. Um, Jack asks, what's this all about? And Jerry says, well, it's all about money. And then Jack surprises us, this whole conversation that follows this surprise, and Jack says, what about the money I gave your your sons? And uh, Jerry reveals that his family was always more excited to see Uncle Jack on TV than to see him. So we find out that Jerry's got a wife and kids, and uh, theoretically should be happy. But um, Jack, very interestingly, says, "Oh boy, I sure have envied you all my life. You know, I was always forced to travel and never had time to settle down." I, I'd have traded places with you uh, in a heartbeat, you know? I would have gone with you to that surgeon and begged him to give me your chin. Maybe if you're lucky, someday someone will come along to put me out of out of your misery, too. <laughs> so, clearly I'm not buying this. No. But, Jack, I think it's amazing how, how um, Joel Crothers has created this completely different personality for Jack. Uh than Jerry, just with this one little scene, because, I mean, we've only just seen Jack, you know, standing up to torture, but he, he's clearly a different person, just from the way he's acting. Uh, I think it's pretty amazing that uh, yeah. that that he's able to, to do that uh, and make such a distinct difference in personality when he's been playing a guy playing Jack for several months now. Um, I think it's pretty pretty amazing what he's done there. Yeah, um, I was actually going to comment on that too. Joel Crothers play, plays this beautifully. He just does an amazing acting job because he manages to convey just in the way Jack speaks, you know, in the way he, he forms his words, in the way he, he moves, um, the way he stands. He, you can see it's a totally different person. And mm -hmm. uh, he manages, I, I'd noticed actually even even coming up to this scene that he does manage to convey these differences. Even even before we have this scene, even when we just see Jack in the dungeon, and uh, I think it was about a week ago when we saw Jack kind of looking out the, you know, the cracks in the walls of his dungeon, and, and just the way he does that is, is very different than the way Joel Crothers plays Jerry. So it, it's an amazing piece of acting from mm -hmm. him. And I think we're... You know, I think it's obvious that he's lying to Jerry about that. He's just trying to figure yeah. out a way to not get, to not die. And he's like saying, oh, you know, I'm glad I'm going to be put out of my misery because my existence is terrible, you know. So I don't know how much that'll play with Jerry because Jerry's been living his, his lawyer life and and working for the president life. And so he knows whether or not that's, uh, that's something uh, that would be wearing or whether that's actually quite a great role. 
Well, I, I think it's also um, Jack, again, uh, throwing a little bit of shade on Jerry and saying, look at all the work you did to become me. And it it's really not worth it because I wasn't happy. So, mm -hmm. you know, you've, you've done all this and you've thrown away your old life, which was better, and you haven't really gotten much in return. Julia is startled by two monks who... Uh run into her in the garden, and she finds out they're Brick and Amy in disguise. So they've managed to get off the yacht without having poisoned everyone <laughs> one it accidentally. It would be really, really interesting, and I guess we will never actually know, but it would be really interesting to know just how that dinner came off. Mm -hmm. Princess Celeste sends word via a footman, I guess, um, that she will see Julia and Jack in an hour. So, um, finally have a more than just a fleeting close-up of her mouth on the phone scene with Princess Celeste, I think. Um, then uh, Brick and Amy go off on their own to explore, They're still dressed as monks, uh, I believe, and uh, they find the prince's rooms, and here we find out what's happened to the prince, because Amy says, these must have been the prince's rooms when he was still alive. So, um, somehow they're aware that the princess died. Now, I don't know if that was some other dialogue from before, or if that's something they overheard, you know, during the party or on the yacht or something that we weren't privy to. But I think uh, this is the first inkling we've had. Well, we didn't even realize that the king wasn't the Celeste's husband until today. But I guess his son passed away before he could give an heir, I guess, and maybe Princess Celeste just said to the king, oh, well, I am pregnant, and then has been scrambling, you know, for the last year to to get that to happen. So, uh, presumably the prince died a, about a year ago, and she quickly um, hatched this scheme to, to, uh, to have a baby. Well, and we don't know the circumstances of his death. It, it could have been sensational enough that it might have been on the international news. I mm. mean, they are royalty, so that's a possibility as well. So after looking at the prince's rooms, they hear crying, and of course are drawn to John Perkins's room, mm -hmm. and uh, they watch the baby crying, and there's a guard in red standing next to him. And Amy is certain that that is her son. Lakin visits Christy and asks why she's doing this to Ted. Is, it, is, is this because he caught you stealing? Is this to get back at me? One of those men that you sleep with went a little too far? Just as Mary walks in. So Mary chases Lakin out after hearing that. Uh, Mary then tells Mason that she has no forgiveness for Ted. She's actually kind of surprised by that because she's, you know, dealt with rape victims before. Um, and she wants to see him locked up for the rest of his life. Mason uh, asks Steve why he's dragging his feet on getting Ted's bail set. And, you know, Steve's been you know, judge hopping for judges that he knows aren't available, apparently. And Mason says that he needs to watch out. Trust me, I know. It's a long way to fall. Mm -hmm. He has been in that exact same job. Theta enters AA. Mm -hmm. Let's see how that goes. Uh, Steve keeps saying what a bad prosecutor he'd be if he let Ted go free. And it's uh, kind of weird because he's sometimes you know, says it just to himself, so there's clearly something going on in his head, I think. Yeah, I was thinking that too, um, because there is also a point where he says something like, you know, rapists are just, they're the lowest form, mm -hmm. you know, and he's going on and on. And, and you might think he would be saying this in front of, you know, other people, but he, I think it's just when he's in the room with Christy, so he, he almost seems to be disassociated from his own actions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then he tells Christy that Ted would be safer in jail, because someone out there might just take the law into his own hands. Mm -hmm. And I think this is, you know, probably a really good motivation uh, for Christy, you know, to go through with, with, uh, you know, pressing charges, because now she's thinking, well, you know, I don't want, obviously she doesn't want her brother to kill Ted, mm -hmm. but, so 
maybe she's thinking, well, maybe Ted would be better off in jail than, than being murdered by Steve. So this has kind of really pushed Christy into a corner. So Christy's also visited by two women from a women against rape organization. Mm -hmm. And uh, they try not to push her uh, one way or the other as to whether to press charges. They're kind of at odds with Mary and Theta over that because it's Christy, up to Christy, um, according to them. Uh, in the end, Christy agrees to press charges, largely because I think of what Steve has said to threaten mm -hmm. Ted. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at, at this point, we also don't know exactly, you know, maybe the full extent of Christy and, and Steve's history. So, obviously, we know that there has been this coercive sexual relationship and all of that. But, you know, it, it's possible that that uh, Steve has done other violent things before that that might indicate that he is actually capable of, of killing someone, you know, beyond this attack on Christy. Mm -hmm. So she might actually know some other things mm. from his background that, that maybe the others um, have never seen. That's it for the Monday episode. Uh, this is our last episode for James and Chuck. And they managed not to be killed, mm. so they don't end up in the graveyard, but I think they will go to the Psycho Gazebo. So are these our characters who we will never see again? Is this No, because uh, someone's last episode was Friday. Oh. And uh, it wasn't Nick. It wasn't Any Nick. other guesses? I don't have the full list of the cast here, but... Um, I'm... I'm Obviously, well... it's not anyone who was in this episode. It's not Chuck Larry, Eden... Even actually, we didn't see, did we? They just said she was outside. Uh, Cruz, Nick, Julia, Amy, Brick, Jack, Jerry. I'm going to guess maybe Miss Parks is finally off the credits. Mrs. Oops, question. Mrs. Mrs. Parks. Mrs. Jackie Parks. All right. Well, the person was on Friday's show. Oh, okay. So it's someone who was on that show, and that was their last episode. So it's not Jackie. Now I'm trying to remember who was on the episode, even though we just recapped it. Um... Um, I, I don't know. All right, we'll see. We'll see if it's mentioned, or if they just never mention this person again. Oh. Uh, it's hard to know. Well, if uh, they never mention them again, you'll definitely have to tell me who it was. Yeah, I'll probably tell you before the next person leaves. I think we have probably about a one and a half months before someone else leaves, I think. So... Uh, and um, I have some indication that uh, my IMDb information might not have been correct for the previous person who left, so oh. which you had guessed was Gina. Mm -hmm. So uh, we will see if you were right, and B, if that person actually is gone uh, at some point in the next month or two, I think. So anyway, um, IMDb, not the, the best... Uh, source, but well, it's, it's the correct. only source we have right now, other than, well, I got this other information from Santa Barbara Online, um, which indicated the character that I thought was gone has at least one more episode. So. All right, we'll be back after we watch episode 252 of Santa Barbara. See you then. Bye-bye. Jerry? Yes, I know, they always took us for brothers. I just added a few little touches. Yeah, well, it must have hurt like hell. What they do, take a saw to your chin? Welcome back. Hello. We finished episode 252 of Santa Barbara. Originally aired Tuesday, July 23rd, 1985. Kelly tells Cece that Nick saved her. She also tells him there was nothing romantic between them. Cece is shocked when... Kelly tells him that Jack Lee is behind their kidnapping. Uh, Cece tells her about Ted. 
And then Dr. Morrison comes over uh, and tells Ke Kelly that her memory might return. He also uh, tries to get Cece to come in for his test, but Cece says he doesn't have time. Mm -hmm. uh, so Kelly lies down in the study and looks at a photo of Joe and has uh, one of her old headaches with the psycho music that uh, she had when she was in the gazebo. So she seems to be still afflicted with whatever it was that she had uh, all those months ago when when Joe was killed. So um, I guess that's still an ongoing thing. CC apologizes to Ted for the way he uh, phrased things when they were on the phone and Ted uh, seems to forgive him. Uh, Ted also tells Mason not to use Christie's past against her, mm -hmm. but Mason says they pretty much need to use everything they can. Yeah. Uh, Steve questions Jade. She was not expecting to uh, have Steve Bassett show up, um, but he kind of just says uh, that he saw her that next morning and wanted to know if she was there that night. And uh, she says she wasn't, but then he said, oh, I think you're lying. So he must have seen her there then. Mm -hmm. when uh, That's what I think, too. Yeah, and it's interesting that Jade doesn't find it suspicious that he somehow knows she was there. But uh, she admits she saw... Uh, Ted and Christy fighting, and uh, so that's enough for him. Mm -hmm. uh, says that he'll call her as a witness. Uh, Mason calls a press conference at La Mesa, and he announces that Ted is innocent, and that Steve just has something against rich people, which we have seen. That whole family uh, has something against rich people. And also that mentions that Christy hung out with a bad crowd, and... Uh, Starts to be smirch her character, and Mary runs up to the podium to stop him. He wraps things up, so Steve takes over the podium and says he's speaking as a brother, not as an mm -hmm. assistant district attorney. Um, but then he veers into district attorney character uh, mode by saying that uh, they have an eyewitness, uh, and it was um, it was Ted's good friend Jade Perkins. And uh, he makes it sound like uh, Jade's going to testify that she actually witnessed the rape. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, Christy moves into the apartment two doors down from Steve. And she and Theta watch the press conference on TV. And afterwards, Mary comes over and Christy says that she was always able to confide in her. Uh, and she wants to tell her something about the rape. And this is actually the second time we've seen her try to tell Mary something and the first time of course Steve came in so I wouldn't hospital be hospital room I mm -hmm. wouldn't be particularly surprised if Steve somehow comes in again no, or they because when they moved in Mary and Theta and and Christy um, were in the apartment and then Steve came in and unlocked the door with his own key so we yeah. know he has made us his own key to that apartment mm -hmm. So, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if he walks in. Because there's no way Mary would keep that secret if she knew. Like, she would side with Steve and Christy. She would... Yeah, I think we we need to... I, I'm assuming we're going to be heading towards some kind of a trial on this. And some sort of drama around this before the truth is revealed. Let's just try... Seeing if the right side of your face will brighten up with this. A little bit. Yeah, it got rid of that shadow. Professional. Lakin confronts Jade about her uh, so-called testimony, and she explains that all she saw was Christy and Ted arguing, mm -hmm. uh, and that uh, Steve Bassett had made it sound worse. Um, they visit Ted to explain, and Jade says to him, I saw you fighting, and I got scared, and I left. I didn't see you rape her. So, Lincoln and Ted decide that perhaps she shouldn't tell her story to too many other people until she gets on the stand, because uh, with uh, states, statements like that, um, news yeah. will travel fast. So, uh, And then later, Ted has to appear before uh, an initial judge to enter his plea, and he pleads not guilty, of course. Mm -hmm. Nick comes to see Kelly, but she is snapping, as we know, so Cece tells him to come back later. And Nick says, so, uh, did Kelly tell you what happened? And Cece says, yep. 
And of course, Cece's referring to what happened with regards to Nick not being the kidnapper, but mm -hmm. Nick assumes he's talking about their whole romance during those three and a half weeks. And so Nick says, uh, are you all right with that? Cece says, sure. <laughs> and so Nick rushes off, but before uh, Cruz can uh, tell him that Kelly actually doesn't have any memory of the last three and a half weeks, Nick uh, Nick leaves and goes to get himself all ready because he's going to propose to Kelly the minute he sees her. So later he returns to the Capwell house all dressed up and Kelly opens the door and she says, oh, I really want to thank you for everything. I'll always be grateful. Why don't you stay for dinner with us? And you can see by the look on Nick's face that he realizes immediately that she has no memory of that time. Yeah, this is actually a nice bit of acting on his part as well because he kind of lets it show in his eyes that he he understands the, the situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I guess Nick will be having a very uncomfortable dinner uh, with the Capwells in his best suit. Uh, but it would be interesting if Kelly's memory does return. Mm -hmm. I don't remember. I don't remember. Uh, from the original time I watched it, if she ever remembers, or if you know Nick ever tells her, or what what happens. Yeah, I, I'm. I I guess Nick is uh, basically trying to acclimatize to this situation, and it'll be interesting to see if he uh, tries to woo her afresh. You know, mm -hmm. tries to make a fresh start at a at, uh, with the aim of a romantic relationship, or if he is content to be in the friend zone. Um, I would think he would try, you know, just to reproduce everything from the ghost town, kind of like Groundhog Day, where he already knows what to do. Unfortunately, the memory of Joe Perkins is now an impediment to mm -hmm. Kelly uh, being able to, you know, repeat those same, that same pattern that they did in the ghost town. So I, I think he may try a few things to jog her memory and uh, they're all going to be thwarted. So unless she actually does regain her memory, I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, or maybe it'll be very slow going. And that's about it for this Tuesday episode. So we will return after we watch episode 253 of Santa Barbara. See you then. Bye-bye. Welcome back. Hello. We finished episode 253 of Santa Barbara, which originally aired Wednesday, July 24th, 1985. And just before we recorded this podcast, we watched a Vegas episode, and Lloyd Botchner was the, uh, I guess he was the villain in it. Big surprise. I, I think we've seen Lloyd Botchner as the villain in quite a few of these shows from the 1970s. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think he's been... A villain in at least two Vegases that we've seen. Well, we started watching it with the 1980 episodes because uh, that's when we got the Bean TV and they were showing it on Decades, which we didn't get before. So we watched the last half of the series first, and now they've started over at the beginning and we're watching the first half. So we're, this was episode four, I think, three or four. Nick and Kelly... Uh, are finally talking, and uh, Kelly asks Nick about what happened in those three weeks, and Nick says that they talked a lot about Joe, and uh, that she rekindled his love for photography, which is, uh, I guess his storyline is kind of not that, I guess, exciting. This Nick, Nick's love for photography being rekindled as a, as a plot for his entire arc, but um, I guess, I guess that's what he has, so. He's well, I, I mean, I, I don't think that was wrong. We do seem to see him have a new love for photography mm -hmm. that he was missing before because he was so damaged from his experience, I guess, with Vietnam and, and not being believed uh, in other situations. So no, that's not wrong. It's not wrong. I just find it hard to get my head into that same space to kind of sympathize with the whole the whole thing. Well, yeah, it's a it's it's a bit of a come down plot wise. I mean, imagine, you know, going for an interview for a job as a as a character and go, "Now your character's going to finally in the end 
um, renew his love for photography. And meanwhile, you know, Cruz is like, okay, you're going to put out a fire on an oil rig. <laughs> and then, you know, Nick's kind of like, well, so my story is I, I regain my love for photography. Mm, that's that's going to be an exciting thing to watch for the viewers. Um, later, Cruz tells Kelly that Nick obviously has a crush on her. And Kelly says, oh, no, he knows that I'd never forget about Joe. Which is an interesting thing to say, because the logical thing for Cruz to say was, well, you did forget about Joe for three and a half weeks. Hmm. But neither of them thought of that. So, uh, Nick sends her a book about ghost towns in the hope that she will recall something about their time together uh, with, an, with an eye towards still being in love with him. And... Um, she does end up going to her window to watch the sunrise, just as she had during in the ghost town. So, uh, perhaps subconsciously. I mean, there's no real reason she should have lost those memories, right? Well, there isn't probably a real reason why a memory machine like that, mind-wiping machine like that, would work in the first place. What? <laughs> But I did what I, one of the things I did find interesting about Nick sending her the the book on ghost towns is that he he doesn't actually sign it. I, mm. I don't think. Oh. And I, I thought that was kind of a curious choice if he's trying to um, have her associate ghost towns with her relationship mm. with Nick. I didn't realize that. And also, I mean, she's had a history now of getting so many odd things, you know. <laughs> Um, in the mail, in it's the mail. surprising they it, let I her open it. I think that would be a bit triggering, actually. Yeah, especially since Jack Glee hasn't been caught yet. You'd mm -hmm. think they would vet her mysterious packages a little bit. The family's been pretty slack on the, you know, missing and targeted relatives uh, not being protected that well, considering how much money they have and how many guards they probably have there. Mm-hmm. So, uh, at one point, Nick puts up his sign when Cruz pays him a visit that Kelly made. He puts it up inside his apartment. So, I kind of thought it was like a, a shield. What is that called? A uh, sign that you put outside the, you know, your house, your, your business. Um, maybe he's going to run it from in there, but you think it should be outside so people will see it and think, hey, there's a photographer here. I need some photography done. Yeah, he doesn't put it out on his, you know, out on his shingle or anything. He doesn't, you know, put it where someone would actually see it. It's almost like he's reminding himself that he's a photographer. Yeah. yeah. Rick and Amy are still dressed as monks. That disguise has done them well, because they haven't run into any real monks. Especially not the ones who are missing two pairs of robes, apparently. But monks are apparently ubiquitous enough that no one questions them wandering around in the palace. I think they're in the palace, right? The palace uh, seems to be this big, you know, maybe... I mean, Julia has a room somewhere. Is that in the palace, too? Are they all in the palace? I, I almost wondered if it was, um, like, when we went to, to France... We saw some of these castles, which were really villages mm -hmm. on the top of hillsides. And I remember Monaco almost had a bit of that feel to it as well. And I, I wonder if it's that kind of kingdom where you actually have a lot of the, the main city, especially if it's on a little island, a lot of the main city is actually within sort of the walls of a larger enclosure. I mean, at one point, Monaco almost seemed like one big building to yeah. me. So they find John, who's now in the throne room with the nurse, and they convince the nurse to let them uh, um, pay their respects to the future king. Mm -hmm. And Amy almost gets the nurse to allow her to hold the baby when Princess Celeste shows up and wonders what they're doing. And they say, oh, we're just paying our respects to the new king. We want to say some prayers. But before they can really go on much further, the king arrives and shoes everyone out because he wants to spend some time with his grandson. Um, just from those few seconds, Brick seems to feel that the king is a good guy and would probably help them. 
now I think they know that they're you know pulling something over on the king I suspect so but uh, almost immediately Julia shows up with some documents she's managed to steal from Jack and they detail the whole plot against uh, against the kingdom basically to substitute this John in as the the new heir and surprisingly there's also some information in the documents that shows that uh, his royal court is trying to poison him or whoever you know the prime minister and the, the group um, he finds those uh, hides them on his throne he figures that's the best option because maybe no one else would dare go go towards the throne it's, it's quite a large room actually that throne room set or at least it's filmed to seem quite quite uh, like Quite long because there's a lot of empty space in between the door and the throne, and very little else other than a couple of pillars and a red carpet. Well, I think um, with the idea of a throne room was that you'd have this this very ornate seat for the the king or the leader, and then all of the courtiers would be gathered around. So you'd need to have a large enough space, even in a small kingdom, because really. I guess in, in terms of these things in the real world, that's probably not a very large throne room, but you do have to have enough space probably for the people in government or whatever when they attend for a ceremony or, or for, you know, whatever kind of rights of government they have to participate in that requires the king to be there. I have a feeling that the, the finale of the storyline is going to take place there because we've got room for all the characters. John seems to hang out there. Uh, so I think uh, when it all comes to a head, it might be in that room. But it was interesting to me that uh, the king just kind of goes and sits on his throne because I, I, my, my perception always is that, in, again, in the real world, I don't think Queen Elizabeth goes and hangs out on her mm. throne. I think that's just reserved for, for ceremonial purposes or for certain rights of government. So that envelope could have been sitting there for months, really, in, mm -hmm. in the real world before or someone spotted it. Yeah, the king uh, takes about a second to read maybe the top sheet of this not too thick uh, thing of papers. And says, oh, can I really be surrounded by traitors who are trying to poison me? He's a very fast reader. It's Patrick. He just bought life insurance. Um, yeah, so anyway, he knows the whole plot. So I think uh, it's going to come to a head pretty quickly now because mm -hmm. it's not like... I mean, I can't imagine his guards are are working against him. Um, so he could probably immediately order the arrest of the, the plotters and uh, wrap things up and give Amy her baby and send them home on a, the royal cruise ship or something. Now, we still don't quite know, and I'm hoping this will be revealed soon, why it is that Amy was picked mm. and sort of how they managed to go about this. Mm -hmm. I think that would be really interesting to hear more about. I think the king will just order someone to reveal everything at some point. That would be the easiest way. And uh, I guess, I wonder if the real Jack knows the king. You know, once if the real Jack manages to get out and mm -hmm. talk to the king. There, that could be, you know, a really rapid ending to this. Christy, as you recall, was about to tell Mary the truth uh, when Steve walks in, which we predicted. Yeah. Uh, and the Mary, who, you know, as a nun, she's just been asked by her sister if she can tell her something in secret that she wouldn't tell anyone else. Mary promptly goes, Hey, Steve, uh, Christy wants to tell us something about the rape that she's been keeping a secret. So that's a really bad, you know, counselor. Yeah, that made me think that perhaps Mary was not the best at, uh, you know, keeping confidences and, and maybe wasn't actually that great at her job as a counselor or as a nun for that matter. Well, now with her, you know, thoughts that she's had that uh, she wants Ted to fry in hell, perhaps she'll decide that nunnery isn't really mm -hmm. her thing, which might leave uh, an opening for Mason Could to be. Uh, date her. So. Um, Christy covers by saying that what she wanted to say was that she had, she had been hoping that Ted would be her boyfriend, which is true, um, and something that Mary didn't know. But when Mary leaves, Steve says, 
It was stupid to try and tell Mary. He says, you've got everything you've ever wanted. Your family is together. And don't forget what's going to happen to him if you talk. So the threat against Ted's life again. Um, and uh, she kind of resigns herself, I think, to keeping that secret. And he tells her not to go outside. So he wants to keep her kind of locked away in her apartment until the trial, I think. I think for forever in some ways. Mm -hmm. I actually think um, even her her covering and saying that she had wanted Ted to be her boyfriend. And as we know, that is true. I think that actually rattled Steve quite a bit mm. because he didn't want to hear that. And I think the fact that it was true and he knows it is true, um, I think that really, really enraged him even more because there's nothing... He can do all sorts of things to Christy, and he can probably do a lot of things to Ted, but there's no way he can eliminate that fact that Christy, given a range of options, would not choose Steve. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think what the writers are doing, basically telling Jade, don't, don't repeat your story to anyone. Christy. No, no. Last time. Oh, don't, right. Uh, they were telling Jade not to not to repeat her story till she's on the stand. And now Christy being isolated from everyone from a writing standpoint is because obviously I think they're going to want all of this to unfold on the witness stand and mm -hmm. not have the characters already piecing together and picking apart stories before the trial because mm -hmm. that kind of will undercut, you know, any, you know, revelations on the stand because um, obviously this is going to be a, a trial thing and you know Steve will want to reveal some surprises on the stand and hopefully Mason will be able to as well yes yes I, I definitely predict it will come down to them being on the stand and um, I think taking away cr any any um, connections Christy has with the outside world will definitely preserve that element of surprise I can definitely imagine a few cliffhangers in the courtroom with, you know, the episode ending with Christy opening her mouth to say something and the viewers not quite knowing what it'll be. I think Jade's testimony will be good because of the actual phrases that she heard, which she hasn't repeated yet to anyone, but will probably repeat back on the stand the words she heard Ted say, which taken out of context will sound really bad. So I suspect she may be one of the first witnesses and then things will, will look quite dire for Ted from that point on and maybe some tension between Lakin and Jade um, because she didn't quite reveal how bad her testimony was going to be. Yes, I think so. And then I, I, I personally think it's going to end with the ultimate reveal of Steve's part in this. And, you know, that that's what I'm assuming this will build up to in one way or another. Um, but I do think Jade will not do well on the stand. I mean, we've mm -hmm. already seen that she can be bullied quite easily by Steve, um, even without the threat that he had to use mm -hmm. against Christy to to wreck uh, Ted's life and, and possibly end Ted's life even. I, I mean, Jade just kind of crumbled. Mm -hmm. um, crumbled in front of him, even, even when he didn't actually have, it seemed to me, legally the right to even be questioning her, so... If this does lead to Steve's downfall, then presumably he will lose his job and there'll be an assistant DA spot open. Mm -hmm. And maybe with Mason winning the case, he would be possibly positioned to get his job back, especially as this will reflect badly on the DA himself, mm -hmm. having okayed uh, this going to trial. So it may, you know, be Steve and Tony Patterson who... who uh, leave and Mason might just say well I'm not going to settle for assistant DA this time I might as well just go for DA and then I'll, then I'll have some power against my enemies who happen to live in a mansion that I grew up in mm -hmm. yeah that could that could be very interesting I, I think it's going to be really interesting to see what happens to all of these characters we've already speculated that this might leave an opening eventually for for Mary to uh, leave the church and perhaps pursue a romance with Mason. It'll be really interesting to see what happens to 
Steve and Christy and to a certain extent Theta or what Christy's relationship with her family is after this. And then there's also the real Jack and Lindsay Smith and Julia who also might vie for some of these potential new openings in the district attorney's office. And let's not forget the other court cases going on. So we've got Sophia. That's right. Who is also being charged with, uh, I think it's second degree murder. Is it second degree? Something it's something like that. Um, I think that was the plea deal. Oh, that if was she the plea. plea to second degree. So maybe they're going to charge her with first degree, which will be, I think, really hard to, mm -hmm. to prove. I think that's a slam dunk for the real Jack Stanfield Lee, who already looks cleverer than Jerry after only you know, two short scenes together. Yes, yes. And, of course, we've got the one with uh, Maggie Gillis and, and her the case she's bringing on behalf of, of Ben against the Capwell Industries. Mm -hmm. If that goes to trial, then we'll have three cases over the next month or so. That's um, a good thing we have lots of lawyers. Cece might just be tired of it all said lots. Let's just write a check to Maggie Gillis because <laughs> I don't want to go through another. I've just had two trials. <laughs> You know, that is actually a good point if they find themselves wanting to maybe start pursuing other storylines and they need a little bit of space. That would be a very quick way to resolve that particular story. So I can imagine the writer saying, okay, we're writing three trials in a row. You know, um, But then again, we had half the cast in the hospital at one point when uh, Maggie was in there and Elizabeth and a few other people. I forget what... Uh, Oh, was it after the fire? No, I forget. I don't think it was well, earthquake related. There was some incident where everyone. We did have a lot of everyone, them sick after the was earthquake. The, or yeah, no, injured, but this I was this was another incident. I don't know. Um, Mason strongly suspect that, suspects that Ted wants to go see Christy, and tells him it would violate the terms of his bail. Ted therefore goes to see her anyway, and basically gets three words out of his mouth when she opens the door before Steve discovers him and kicks him out. Um, then Steve goes to the Capwell house, where Ted is now, with Mason, and he tells Mason that he'll have Ted's bail revoked, but Mason convinces him that Ted wasn't aware of the terms, even though, you know, because uh, he said, well, CC Capwell signed it, and he says, well, my dad didn't really properly, you know, tell Ted that he couldn't do that. Um, Mason tells Ted it might be better if they try to talk to Mary rather than Christy, um, he arranges to meet her at La Mesa. Now, I thought it was going to be Ted and Ted and Mason talking to Mary, mm -hmm. but uh, when he shows, when Mason shows up alone, Mary leaves because I think she doesn't want, you know, him to try to come on to her. And I think when they were dancing together, she suddenly found herself surprised that maybe that she was interested. Mm -hmm. So for, for a short second, I think it was actually really smart of the writers to position it so that Steve is basically in the apartment next door to Christy. And not only does that enhance his whole character's image as being this sort of control freak person who wants to have complete control over what Christy does and, and who she sees, but it also provides a really convenient excuse for why Steve keeps popping up in all of these scenes. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. Kelly says to Ted that Christy probably named him just because she needed to lash out at someone. So that was a very sh short scene with Kelly and Ted. It was nice to see the siblings have a scene together again. Jerry starts to caress Julia's neck. And she says that she's been waiting for him to do the one thing that will win her heart all this time. And, of course, that's just a trick to make Jerry go and visit Jack to find out what's that one thing that would win Julia's heart. And Julia follows him and listens at the door to the dungeon as Jerry goes to talk to Jack. Now, inside the dungeon, Jack says, with all the weight I've lost, I could probably crawl through this hole by now because he's removed that one brick again and looked out at the garden. Uh, Jerry comes down to talk to him. And uh, when he realizes that he's trying to get info about Julia, Jack taunts him about Julia throwing him another curveball. And Jerry sla slaps him. So this was the first time we've seen a, sp a split screen, I think, between Jerry and Jack. I don't think last time. I think they just cut back and forth mm -hmm. between them last time. 
either that or we were so familiar with it nowadays it didn't even I didn't even notice it but of course it looked very fake um, Jerry was staring off uh, not quite where Jack was sitting or standing so uh, but the slap looked pretty good because I think Jerry slapped I think actually it must have been a film of Jack with Jerry standing in front of the screen which is why it looked like he was looking to his left but then when he slapped him um, that actually looked pretty good because they, they synced it up very well so um, so um, yeah um, Jerry slaps him and says he is going to die at midnight so I guess he's had it with keeping Jack alive mm -hmm. so Jack asks to see a priest before he dies and later a monk comes down the stairs and Jack decides that will have to do as long as I confess my sins I guess it doesn't matter he starts to confess and uh, then spots Julia's pink toenail polish on the monk and realizes it's Julia who has borrowed a robe from Rick and Amy and uh, he starts to talk about regretting that one beautiful relationship that he messed up especially since she was such a great role in the hay at which Julia removes her hood and says, How dare you? Jack says, You never could take a joke. So he explains to Julia that Jerry Cooper is his cousin. We finally have Jerry's last name after all these months. Jerry Cooper. Um, he asked her to untie him, but she wants to resolve some things first. Um, she, he says, Speaking of resolving things, how did you manage to fend off Jerry's advances all this time? I think she says, who says I fended them off? Then they hear voices at the top of the stairs. So I think Julia has to think fast about what she's going to do here. I have to say in this scene, as you know, as a viewer, you're just wanting them to get out of there. Yeah. But Very you know, stressful to watch. Yes. Him but, being tied up and her not untying him. Exactly. And, and Julia's kind of choosing, chosen this moment to uh, have it out about their relationship. But I have to say, Julia is so Augusta in this moment. Like, you could really see them being sisters, because I imagine that's exactly what Augusta would right. do as well. Right, yeah. That's really good. I thought when he was saying about, he was talking about that one woman, and he, you know, he talked her up quite a bit, saying, you know, all of her good attributes. I thought he was going to say, and her name was Augusta Lockridge, but I think he might have had something else thrown at him if he'd done that. So I, uh, when I'm making these uh, the notes while watching the show, I try to abbreviate the names a bit when I'm typing. So I just put the first initial of the character and, and put their dialogue sometimes to as, you know, to quickly summarize the scene. And uh, I found it uh, has been getting more annoying because uh, at first I only had to contend with if there was a scene bit with Lionel and Lakin in it, I had two L's, and so I'd have to type out the full names. But then we had Jack and Julia. And then we have Jack and Jerry. And now we have Jack, Jerry, and Julia. And now we have Mason and Mary, who are constantly paired up in scenes. So I'm having to type out the names quite a lot more. And with Mason and Mary, you couldn't even just type out... M.A. I, I did that once or twice, and I had to backspace and write the whole thing. At least now I can put J.C. for Jerry Cooper, J.L. for Jack Lee, and J.W. for Julia Wainwright. So, And then Lionel Lake and I usually write out. So, that is it for episode 253. We'll be back after we see episode 254, which is a Thursday episode. And we are rapidly approaching the end of year one. We'll see you then. Bye. Welcome back. Hello. Last night we watched episode 254 of Santa Barbara, originally aired Thursday, July 25th, 1985. So we're, we must be into the sweeps by now. Mm -hmm. Jack tells Julia that he has a yacht on the other side of the island waiting for him. Now, that must have been hidden there quite a while if uh, it's something that Jerry doesn't know about. Hopefully he's got a guy just waiting for Jack to give the word to go. So, hopefully uh, they'll find that yacht when they all escape and race for the, for the yacht. Um, he asks Julia again to untie him, and uh, Jerry comes down the stairs. 
And Julia quickly puts up her hood, and Jack uh, taunts him with not being able to impress Julia. And when Jerry tries to hit him, aha, turns out Julia has untied him, and he punches Jerry. Jerry is surprised, and he says, I've got another surprise for you, and he has Julia remove the hood of her monk robe, and Jerry is shocked to see that Julia and Jack are both there. And then Jack punches him out, and swaps clothes with him, ties up Jerry, and then they escape. They go to, I think, Julia's room. I'm trying mm -hmm. to figure out whose room they were in. Uh, a little bit confusing later on, but uh, Jack has a shower, and uh, says, do I look like Jerry? And Julia says, disgustingly. Um, and he reveals to Julia that they've been slowly poisoning the king. And then a guard comes to tell him he's wanted in the throne room. In the dungeon, the torturer shows up to execute Jack, and he's got his gun uh, loaded, and he won't believe him when he says he's Jerry and that Jack switched places with him. But he's saved by Brick and Amy, who think he's Jack, and knock out the torturer to rescue him. So uh, he thinks quickly and says, oh, we shouldn't leave together because it'll be suspicious. He grabs the keys from the torturer, runs up the stairs, and locks Brick and Amy into the dungeon. But they do find the bricks that Jack's been working loose all these weeks or months. And, as Jack had said last time, they, there was enough room for someone to fit through, and they both escaped out the hole into the garden. Uh, what I assume is Julia's room, uh, Jerry changes into his other blue suit. Um, no, maybe, that is, maybe he goes to his own room there, because he does leave again. Yeah, okay. Uh, he exits, and the Prime Minister and Celeste run into him and tell him that the King has somehow discovered their plan. And he says, oh, the packet is still hidden. So, apparently that's the packet that Julia found, and passed along to Amy and Brick, who passed it on to the King. Um, Jerry tells them he's got to do something before meeting the King. So I guess, yeah, that makes sense. He was in his own room, now he assumes Jack's in Julia's room, and he's going to go there to confront him. Meanwhile, Jack's already gone to the throne room. He runs into the PM and Celeste there. They don't realize it's a different guy than the one they just saw, because they both look identical now. Which, you can't have an evil twin story without them both looking identical at some point. And um, the PM's a bit worried about things and suggests that they should maybe kill the king before the coronation, because it's not really necessary that he witness it. And then Celeste talks about the different poisons, so it sounds like she may have been the uh, person who's been poisoning the king. Um, Jack, of course, is trying to keep the king alive, so he says, Oh, I think everything should be fine if we just stick to the, the plan as scheduled. And then uh, one of them says, At least Jack is dead by now. And Jack kind of feels guilty that Jerry's been killed in his place. Um, and Brick and Amy run into the king in the hallway. And they say, oh, we're the ones who gave you the packet. And he seems to be very trusting of them right off. And they talk about, you know, Jack being swapped out. And um, he just wonders why they're, who they are and why they're interested in helping his country. And Amy says that the baby they're about to crown is hers. So I think this king will be, if he doesn't collapse from all the poison, I think will be pretty instrumental in saving them all from from the traitors. Yes, and I think in some ways perhaps having both Jack and Jerry um, both there and, and at some point side by side will bear out um, Rick and Amy's story a little bit more as mm -hmm. well because then they'll be able to say, see, there are two of them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, I think one thing you were mentioning while we were watching this episode was that this famous scar we have heard so much about could be a pivotal feature mm -hmm. in determining between the two, um, Jack and Jerry. Because Julia has actually not gotten Jerry's shirt off at any point yet uh, mm -hmm. to notice that the scar is missing. So, But then I do recall we talked some time ago about maybe he would get a fake scar put on, so that might be another twist. Uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens when the two Jacks need to be identified. Um, Jack heads back to Julia's room, um, 
and finds Jerry there. See, that doesn't make sense. Why is he in Julia's room? Anyway, they're definitely in Julia's room at this point, because Brick and Amy say, we're going to Julia's room. So, um, Jack sees Jerry and says, oh, at least you're not dead. So, Jerry just kind of glosses over this, uh, doesn't, doesn't really, doesn't really forgive Jack for anything. Uh, Brick and Amy burst in, and Brick has grabbed a crossbow off the wall at one point. And so he says, okay, gentlemen, now we find out which one is which. I really think they can use Julia in this Yeah, I'm case. hoping... Uh, even without the scar, you know. Exactly. I, I'm really hoping that when we revisit New Salem again in either the next episode or the one after that, the first thing that'll happen is Julia come, come running into the scene. Although, Jerry could overpower Brick. Mm -hmm. Or maybe even Jack. Jack has, has, Does Jack know either of them? No. Jack's never met either of them, so he has no idea who these people are. Although Julia did describe them mm. to him. Oh, okay. That's good. I'd forgotten that. So, um, Yeah, it could be a, uh, another race through the palace, and if Jerry gets to the... You know, manages to lock them in somehow and gets to the throne room. He might throw a wrench into their works. Mm -hmm. but we will see. It's a new day at La Mesa, and Mary's having lunch there again, and Mason once again tries to talk to her about the case. Um, he says that Ted is going to take a lie detector test, and um, he suggests that maybe it was dark and Christy was mistaken about who attacked her. Mary says, why didn't you mention that at your press conference? And Mason's really only defense as well. Steve's been pretty hard on Ted up to this point. So. Uh, Mason wants her to talk to Ted, and of course she still doesn't want to talk to him. Um, Ted passes the lie detector test, and Mason reports back to Mary and Theta, who are now having a later lunch at La Mesa. Maybe it's dinner now. Uh, and Theta and Mary said, oh yeah, those tests are unreliable. So they both are, are thinking that Ted, you know, somehow beat the test. Um, Steve shows up and promptly says, oh, Christy will take one too, much to Christy's shock. And um, Ted gets so angry that Christy is still sticking to her story that uh, when someone touches him on the shoulder, he spins around and punches him, and it turns out to be Cruz. So uh, Steve tells Cruz to have Ted's bail revoked, but when Cruz uh, gets Ted alone, he says he won't press charges if he promises to stay away from Christy. Mm -hmm. And Ted says he can't do that as it's the only way to prove he's innocent, and he runs off. Ted? Ted is the client from hell, if you're a lawyer. Yeah. If you're his brother. Nice guy, and a but lawyer. not the client you want if you're no. if you're a lawyer. Uh, Steve tells Christy that he knows the professor's machine. That sounds like a Adventures of Superman. Uh, line, uh, and he knows how to beat it, and he says, I can only tell you this once. I will only say this once. Or how, how does that go? Anyway, she takes her test, and she passes. So, meanwhile, Ted is waiting for her to come back to her apartment. So, to me, this would have actually been a pretty easy way for Christy to have made a lot of this go away if she was worried about Ted, Ted's fate, and kind of getting out from under mm. the situation would have been to, you know, it was a high pressure thing. Steve was only going to tell her once, whatever. From my understanding um, of lie detector tests, there's a lot of people who are innocent but tend to be really anxious who don't do very well on them. So, mm. um, to me, if I had been Christy and I, I had been really wanting to get out of this whole situation, it would have been very easy to have just not done whatever Steve did and, mm -hmm. and just pretended that I'd screwed it up. Because Mason and Ted definitely were planning to publicize the results of mm -hmm. Ted's test. So presumably with the whole town on Ted's side, if both of their results were released, mm -hmm. Steve's plan to, you know, make it look like a member of the public, you know, attacked Ted um, because he didn't get his day in court, uh, would, would fall down because the whole town would presumably mm -hmm. be on Ted's side after that news got out. So, I don't know why Christy 
wouldn't have done that. In fact, I, I would have thought most people might have, you know, screwed it up even if, if mm -hmm. they didn't have a reason to. So mm -hmm. um, the other thing, of course, and I don't know if we'll hear more about this, is I'm very curious to know how she beat the test, mm. whether it was some sort of breathing exercises or whether they stuck a magnet under the machine or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I doubt, we're, I doubt they're going to go into it. I mean, probably researched and decided it was too convoluted to, to try to... Maybe we can ask Nick Hartley. He used to be in some kind of secret service. Cruz is working out and misses a call from Eden. Mm -hmm. Here's answering machine. Pick it up. Uh, and Santana arrives with a birthday cake for him. But he says it's a month early. She says, he says, my birthday is the 25th of August. I think Santana knew that. I think so, too. Yeah. So she gives him the birthday cake. They have some cake, and she gives him a birthday kiss. And it's completely obvious that, I guess, Santana's decided, you know, she's not going after Cece anymore, and she's always had a crush on Cruz. And Cruz and Eden are not getting married. She might as well go for it with Cruz. That's really the vibe I got right from the beginning of this episode. Yeah, I think so too. And if, I'm kind of excited about this. Yeah, and if somehow being with Cruz might even help her see Brandon a little more, that's kind of a nice thing to have thrown into the mix as well. Although so. they did discuss about not talking about Brandon the whole day because mm -hmm. he said he didn't want to be put into a in between those things. So they end up going to La Mesa for his birthday, which is, of course, where he gets hit by Ted. And uh, they go back to the houseboat afterwards, and she puts ice on his jaw. And um, he has been talking throughout their whole day about their brotherly, sisterly relationship every time she tries to veer things into a potentially romantic uh, way. Uh, he says, you make a good nurse. And she says, I make a good lot of things, given a chance. So I think she's now overtly told Cruz she's interested. And at the end of the day, as they say goodbye, he gives her a kiss. That seems to be a little less brotherly. And she mentions that, and he says, it's as close as I could get. Mm -hmm. So actually, I'm kind of excited about this, this potential pairing. Well, yes. And of course, as you, you mentioned, uh, we do hear Eden's voice on the answering machine, which... I think does indicate that this little triangle might uh, come into focus um, quite quickly. Mm -hmm. she, just as Santana is leaving, the phone is ringing again, and it's Eden. And Santana actually listens outside the door, and she hears, hears uh, Cruz say to her, it's good to hear your voice. So she kind of has a not-too-impressed look on her face. So yeah, a little more, after a little whole more day of working on Cruz. Yeah. So... And we had a a closing credits with cast credits in it. Yeah, that was interesting. It is all the same credits as we had last time, uh, including still Jackie Parks. So maybe she was hired for the summer and they decided to go another way with it. And Gina Capwell is still in the credits too. So we will see if you're theory that she left the show is correct if she ever vanishes from the credits. And some new people at the bottom after the regular cast, polygrapher Ed Gonzalez, Prime Minister Paul Kent, Princess Celeste Susan Feldon, King Duncan Ross, and Executioner Ryan Hunter, spelled R-I-O-N, I think that's Ryan. Now I am curious to know what character left the cast. I had predicted that Nick was not going to survive um, his encounter with Jack's, or faux Jack's, Jerry's, Jerry's. thugs. Um, but he did. He's, mm -hmm. he's alive and well. And there are no hints in the credits, because everyone's still in them. So, Although, if these are the first credits since the person left, I think it's an up-to-that-date um, list. I think that's how it works. Okay. So, maybe the next time they'll remove someone. Jackie's just raking in the checks, I guess, for not working. Mm -hmm. So you will reveal when the credits reveal. Is that it? I guess so. I guess it makes sense at that time to reveal it because we've got some other people leaving. We don't want to 
have multiple strands of guessing. Okay. But I think uh, I think there'll be some clue in the next week. So on screen. Okay. All right. That is it for the Thursday episode. We've got one week, one episode left in week fifty-two. So we'll be back after we watch episode two hundred and fifty-five of Santa Barbara. We'll see you then. Bye bye. Welcome back. Hello. To the final episode of the week. We have watched Friday, July 26, 1985's episode of Santa Barbara, which is episode 255 in the last in week 52. There's only one episode left in this first year of Santa Barbara, which we'll be doing at the at the uh, beginning of our next podcast. And then we will head into year two. As you might recall, Ted was waiting for Christy while Christy and Mary arrive home. And Christy tells Ted that she passed the lie detector test. And Ted is shocked by this. He says, how could that be? Uh, he insists on talking to her again, as he has several times before. And Mary says that she'll call the police. So Ted's end up, Ted ends up leaving, but tells Kelly that he could see that Christy was scared, but not of him. So, um, Kelly once again urges him not to go and see Christy. He says, think of it from her point of view. If, she's, if she really thinks you did it, then she would be scared of you. Mm -hmm. so. uh, Ted leaves and immediately goes to see Jade Perkins. So we see the Perkins house for the first time since Dr. Renfrew was killed in their living room. Mm -hmm. No evidence of uh, that still being the case, although we didn't see that corner of the room. Perhaps they threw a tarp over him and throw a rug. put uh, some plastic in the window that was broken by the gunshot. Um, I guess once you've had a, an earthquake, you just do a cleanup whenever something happens. Don't well, you know, we've had so many things happen in the Perkins house. We had Peter Flint take a bunch of hostages and then get himself killed and he Joe threw, got killed. threw Joe so. out the window, so that was mm -hmm. another time the window got broken. So. They're going to have a really hard time selling that house. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Ted convinces Jade to invite Christy over and uh, Christy doesn't want to. Mary, she says to Mary, oh, I don't really even get along with Jade. Uh, but Mary says it'd be good of you to see, good for you to see a friend. So uh, Christy goes over there, and she seems to be kind of happy to talk to Jade a little bit uh, until Ted comes out of the back room. I think he's in the, the nursery area. Although I'm not, I think you get to the kitchen that way too. So I'm not quite sure. Um, so Christy tries to leave, but Ted stops her. Then she tries calling the police, but Jade grabs the phone and. Uh, takes it halfway up the stairs with her and then says, I'll go upstairs so you can talk privately. And Ted says, see, now you can now you can say anything to me and you can deny it tomorrow. I think that uh, Kelly and Jade actually gave Ted very good advice, which he has not listened to. Um, and it also occurred to me watching this, you know, Ted is, is very certain that his friendship with Christy will kind of win her over to, you know, her, her confiding in him. Mm -hmm. But it also occurs to me that in some ways, Ted is almost acting a little bit like Steve and that he's kind of almost stalking her to get her to do what he wants. I mean, Christy, I think, I don't think she's, um, she doesn't seem to me to have convinced herself that Ted actually did it, which was Kelly's hypothesis. But mm -hmm. I do think that she is feeling very pressured right now. And, uh, you know, of course, Steve is a, is a monster and has been controlling her, but I think she will perhaps see Ted's behavior as being a little bit controlling as well. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. I don't think this will go too well uh, for Ted. I suspect he may end up in jail if, uh, you know, because this is the nth time he's done that. And, you know, what I've just suggested about Ted appearing perhaps a bit controlling to Christy is going to appear that way to a jury as well, I think, when all this 
mm-hmm. you know, emerges in the courtroom. I think that's part of the reason why they're doing that is right now it's a somewhat circumstantial case, I would say, and you've got two people who've both taken lie detector tests and apparently passed them. Mm-hmm. So there wouldn't be a lot but by piling this on with Ted repeatedly trying to see her and trying to trying to talk to her, that's just going to pile up on top of it. And I think it'll make the courtroom scenes that much more dramatic. As Mason said to Ted uh, yesterday, I think, or the day before, or when he accidentally punched Cruz, didn't you see Steve Bassett was just standing back and letting mm-hmm. you, you know, go off half-cocked so he can say that you have a tendency to get... Uh, overly violent. So. Nick is on the phone with some random doctor asking what he thinks, uh, how long uh, it'll take before Kelly's memory will come back. Of course, he says, well, without examining her, I can't tell. Uh, but he says that normally with these amnesia cases, it's best if, uh, if uh, she regains her memory on her own. Because Nick had said, well, I'm going to try and, you know, do everything I can to make her remember. Uh, Time Magazine gives Nick a job. Uh, he, they want to send him on assignment to Africa and South America, and then uh, he tells Kelly that I can, I can work from Santa Barbara after that. Um, so Kelly is drawing while Nick is in the shower. She draws a picture of Joe, and it looks like uh, Dana Witherspoon to me. Mm-hmm. He had, um, I, I thought, shaggier hair, you know, than Joe number two. Mm-hmm. Um, and she's somewhat surprised when Nick reveals to her that she made his somewhat crappy sign. That uh, she was kind of saying, "Oh, you should get a professional one if you're going to be." Yeah. Uh, and then she finds the garter, and she goes, "What's this?" She goes, "Oh, uh, you used to wear that when you danced for me in the ghost town." And then Kelly leaves very quickly. <laughs> I think uh, that would be a somewhat disturbing thing to hear. Uh, either way, whether you had, uh, you were just annoyed that you couldn't remember or you were freaked out by the fact that this guy <laughs> that you're pretty sure has no feelings for you is suddenly says that you were dancing for him in, in the ghost town. So. Well, I remember before this, and this was one of the things uh, Kelly and Marcello were working on, was Kelly was absolutely adamant that she wasn't going to dance. Remember, she was a, uh, she wouldn't ever dance after Joe had had died. So mm. I think that would be even more upsetting for her to think that here's this weird three week time period when that she can't remember, and she wasn't dancing or doing any of the things she used to like to do with Joe, and and here she finds out that she was doing exactly those things in the woods with some guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think they just need someone just to say to her, well, look, obviously you had amnesia, you didn't remember Joe, and that's, you know, the reason you acted that way. Yeah, but it would still be disturbing to think that um, because you had an injury, you suddenly became a different person for three weeks. Mm. I think that's probably what's disturbing her a bit more than anything else. Mm -hmm. Jack and Jerry switch places for some reason uh maybe just so that the one that i thought the whole time was jerry would be closer to the camera uh and they both claim to be jack and of course brick and amy have no idea uh brick says well you worked for him but uh amy's no help and finally julia arrives and long story short she says that there's one way she can tell for sure who the real jack is she will kiss them both and brick is worried that jerry would grab her and hold her hostage if uh, you know if she picks if she picks Jack but um, she goes ahead and I guess she took something out of her purse without uh, me really noticing but um, uh, she kisses the one on towards the camera first the one I thought was Jerry the whole time and uh, while she's kissing him she puts an X on his collar and then she goes over to the guy to his right and uh, he kisses her eyes first, and then her mouth. Uh, did I miss the part where she said, kiss me the same way you did when we first kissed in Washington? I think that's the important part of the test. 
So anyway, she puts a circle on the back of uh, Jack's collar. And uh, Jerry immediately grabs her when she announces she knows which one's Jack and, uh, and puts her in a, a neck hold. And uh, Jerry says he'll break her neck unless Brick drops the, uh, the uh, crossbow. And instead of disarming it uh, sensibly first, he just hands over the whole armed weapon. And as Jerry ends up running out, he uh, lets off a bow and shoots Brick, uh, grazes him in the shoulder, the, on the right arm. Um, so Jerry runs out, and then Jack runs out after him, and then Julia runs out after them. Now, I do still think it would have been easier if Julia just said to them, lift up your shirts and show me the scar. Mm -hmm, even mm -hmm. if even if Jerry had had a scar put on, I think that would have been worth a, the first shot before actually putting yourself in danger. Yeah, I mean, if that does happen, now that she's got the circles on them I, and the square and the X, I don't think she needs... I don't think they need to, to go this with the scar. I don't That's know. True. We'll see what happens in the next episode. Maybe there'll be an opportunity to check the scar. Now, that might be the other reason, though, why she decided to go this riskier route is so she could mark them. Mm hmm I guess she figured, they'll yeah, both get the drop on us eventually, and we'll be all mixed up again. So, I think the whole uh, point of, the whole, of this whole thing uh, being set in a castle was so that they could have the two Jacks fighting uh, a sword fight against each other. I bet in the writer's room early on someone said, what if they sword fight? And I said, well, then we'll have to set it in a castle. Well, then we'll have to set it in Europe. I, I kind of wonder if they put the, the cart before the horse there, because they really wanted uh, Joel Crothers to be sword fighting himself. But uh, I was very excited when Jerry runs into, I don't know if it was the throne room, but it was a very, another very large room, if not and grabs a sword off the wall, and then uh, Jack Lee comes running after him and grabs the other sword. Uh, this was a very um, darkly lit scene. In fact, even when you could see a full uh, facial um, uh, shot of Jack or Jerry, you couldn't make out uh, that it was even Joel Crothers. So it could well have been two stuntmen um, doing the fight scene, for all we know. Uh, but I think uh, it was pretty impressive. I think the allure also was having a dungeon, too. That was kind of mm. a, a neat thing to have him sort of mm -hmm. strung up in a dungeon. There was something about that as well, I'm sure, was very appealing to the writers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they have a fairly long uh, fight uh, in the room. Julia is nowhere to be seen. She either lost them or, or turned the wrong way or is hanging back and we don't see her. Um, but at one point, uh, I lose track of who's Jerry and who's Jack, and uh, one of them cuts the other on the hand, and, oh, must be this hand, they're both right-handed, and uh, one of them drops the sword, and I'm actually not sure which one it was, and then the other one puts their sword up against his neck. So, I'm hoping that Jack has a sword against Jerry, but it might be the other way around, and I suspect what will happen is Julia will run in, and not being sure which is which will make them the one not kill the other. Because, obviously, they'll both say they're Jack, so... Any other thoughts on that? Um, well, I have to confess I actually missed some of the f sword fight because I was doing an online jigsaw puzzle, but... Um, I did, I did see them run out of the room after each other. Maybe there'll be a reprise at the next. Yes, thing I'm sure there will. After. And maybe it'll be better it lit. Too. Probably cost some money to uh, stage that fight. They may replay it as is uh, at the beginning of the next episode. Uh, meanwhile, Brick and Amy once again happen to randomly run into the king, and the king is very upset because he's realizes he can't trust most of his guards. Um, he has one that he trusts for sure, but he's guarding the baby. So he says, okay, if you and Amy guard the baby, I can take this guard and uh, go after the traitors, which is, of course, uh, really the best thing Amy could hear. So it ends with uh, Brick and Amy going into the nursery, and Amy finally um, having uh, sight of her baby. 
for all these months. Are you excited about that? Um, well, I, I think that it'll be interesting to see if she just, if the baby is, I mean, I'm sure the baby's hers, but she never really saw it. So, you know, when it was born, mm. it was just taken from her. So I'm, I'm sure it is hers and I'm sure she will identify it as hers, but I guess I, I would wonder sort of. Is there going to be any proof at some yeah. point? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I think I just take it as right that is her baby. So, I mean, they went to a lot of trouble to get that baby. So, there must be a reason. I And that's something we still have to find out. So, hopefully, there'll be a reveal. But I think there'll be another couple of which one's Jack scenes. Maybe at least one more for sure, but maybe even two. So. And that is it for week 52. We've done a whole year of mm -hmm. these. We've done 255 podcasts in three different countries. So uh, we will be back Monday with week 53. We'll have uh, one final episode from year one. And then we will launch year two. And so I will, I guess I get a, better get busy on making some, um, some uh, extras for our our uh, end of year release and we will see you in July July 29th see you then bye bye my name is Hans Ryder and mine is the last voice that you will ever hear Kelly Capwell's gonna die we'll all be safe as soon as she's been eliminated then when time comes for me to die I know you're gonna want to go with me Auto pneumonic, limbic, retrograde, but we simply call it the mind scanner. Well, it looks like I have another job. You and your boys. Rick Wallace is to meet with an accident. Pretty little thing, isn't she? <laughs> My kind of girl. A little skinny, though. <laughs> Look at this arm. It's nothing but bone. Let's go, Chuck. Okay. Later, baby. Thirsty? You didn't say please. Please. We get some meat on those bones yet. Girl like you, you must have lots of boyfriends. Maybe one for every day of the week. Hey. <laughs> Bet you make them real happy, too. She's loving it. Probably the first time in years she's had a man around. Tell you what. Later on, I'll talk to the boss about untying you. We can have a little romance, a little Wait fun and game. Please leave him alone. You know, I knew you'd say that. I'll bet that you'd do about anything just to save his neck, wouldn't you? It's a good thing there's nobody searching for you. Guy would drown out there in that rain. Get away from her. Let's go, chap. Been here long enough. I'll be back tonight. So when are you going to tell me who it is? When I get tired of doing this. Stop it! Take your hands off her! You are a slow learner, pal. Hold it! Don't, don't, lady. Help me! Kelly, you must remain calm if this experiment is going to be effective. You think I care? Well, you must. Don't you understand? This is your only chance of survival. If I live, I'm going to tell them everything. And if I die, they'll find you. You wait. Yeah, they'll find you and they'll put you away for the rest of your life. I was hoping we could avoid this. But I'll have to give her a sedative. It might affect the process, but we can't take a chance. Now, hold her down. Damn it, go after him. This time I get the girl. You had her last time in the pool. Hey, she's not anybody's now. You know Jack Lee's orders. Yeah, too much she's gonna die. What a waste. Mr. Lee! No, there's no sign of him yet. He's supposed to be in town. At least, uh, that's what the girl told us. I'm sure he told Kelly everything, memory or no memory. So she's next. What do you want to do with the body? That's your specialty, not mine. 
Will you stop with the radio? Obviously, the copter's still out of range. I say we do it right here. Just to be sure they don't trace it, bury the plates with the body. That should just about do it. I'll get the girl. Now, just one little detail. Come on, honey. Let's go. Let go of me! You're gonna pay for that, little girl. Then you're gonna pay for this, because the police know we're missing. And what is this famous Jack Lee when he's gonna hide out in a missile silo forever? She's got a memory back. What do you mean? You think I forget you two? And what'd you do with Nick? To kill him? A part of it. That should do it. You probably have his name on the camera. No, but I carved his initials in with my trusty little pen knife. One of my better investments, the pen knife. What was that? You see the chopper? Not yet. Well, no, lady, it's time. Uh, the one thing I'm sorry about is that she's so pretty. Please! Oh, look at the pen. Kelly Capwell's Psycho Gazebo welcomes Chuck. Hey, she's not anybody's now. And James. Too much is gonna die. A waste. What were you guys? Identical cousins? CC is shocked when Telly tells him that. Did I say Kelly? Kelly tells him. CC. <laughs> to which Julia removes her head and says, "Her hood." 